big hall on a Thursday. Uh, that's one first ever. The other first ever is that this is the first community call to ever have uh, Dr. Duncan Wong on, who's uh, a co-founder of the Abelian Foundation. Say hi to the people, Duncan. Hi, thanks for having me over here. Really nice to have the opportunity to share uh, some of the exciting stuff from my side to everybody here. Thanks. It is really, uh, really awesome to have you. And uh, actually, during the previous community call, the topic of uh, uh, of uh, quantum computing and com quantum resistant uh, blockchains came up. And since Abelian is a uh, is a quantum resistant layer one, I think uh, it ties into that very nicely. So I, I'm looking forward to that chat. Uh, but before that, I also need to uh, introduce uh, my co-host, who I can't get rid of. It's Hux. You probably already know him. Say hi to the people, Hux. Hello, everyone. Super nice to be here with you on this Thursday. Uh, yeah, this this week I was trying to get rid of Sudo, but I couldn't do it, so I'm here together with him yet again. <laughs> Impossible. I'm I'm very very sticky. It's very hard yeah. to get rid of me. Uh, and yes, of course, uh, I'm Sudo. I always forget to introduce myself. I sort of just assume that everybody knows me by this point because uh, I'm always blabbering on these calls. I'm Sudo, aka Simon, head of community at NIM. And before we jump into our conversation with Duncan, and thereafter. Uh, the announcement of uh, the very exciting NIM Squad League, which a lot of you have been uh, looking forward to uh, to seeing. Uh, we're going to go through, of course, the usual news roundup. Uh, so firstly, uh, I, I really like these little throwbacks that, we're, uh, that we've been doing for uh, quite some time. Um, uh, there's a Twitter thread uh, that was put out about how nodes are getting, some NIM mix nodes are getting rewarded. Uh, it's, it goes into a fair bit of detail. So a lot of you who have been around for a long time in the NIM community probably already understand this if you uh, if you um, operate a node especially, but it's still um, a really nice little uh, recap of uh, of how the uh, the rewarding algorithms work. So hopefully a link will be shared in the chat, not, not only to this, but also to everything else I'm mentioning. Uh, make sure to check it out. Um, the next news roundup is that, um, thanks for everybody for joining our Tuesday, uh, node operator Q and a. So those are one of my personal favorite NIM events every week. They're very cozy and nice. So if you operate a NIM node or are thinking about operating one, uh, make sure to, uh, to join those. They take place at, um, 3 PM UTC, uh, on Tuesdays, uh, sorry, it's bi-weekly. So every, every second Tuesday now as, sh as shared with you guys, uh, on, on the most recent, uh, AMA. Uh, we're adding a few regular segments um, uh, as requested by the community. So one of those are going to be an update uh, by Pomflick and myself about the delegations program. Uh, since a lot of you who are joining those uh, those AMAs uh, are participants of the uh, of the delegations program, um, and um, um, what was the other thing? It's not in my notes. Anyways, if you want to know what the new regular segments are, you will need to join in two weeks on Tuesday. I'm going to tease like that and act as if I knew what the other thing was, which I don't. <laughs> uh, moving on to the next somewhat bigger piece of news, which is uh, which is a very, very uh, exciting piece of news. So uh, NIM received a $150,000 grant from uh, the Zcash Foundation to integrate the Mixnet uh, and provide privacy protection for the, uh, for the uh, uh, Zcash community. Now, this is, of course, a really uh, great piece of news. So this is hopefully... Um, one of the first examples of many others to come where the privacy tech stack, like different pieces of the privacy tech stack, um, uh, join forces to provide even high, even a stronger privacy. So as you guys know, uh, Zcash provides transactional privacy for your, uh, for your, uh, transaction transactions, but network level privacy, of course, is, is something that the NIM mixnet is, uh, uh, is truly excellent at and, and unique at. So combining these two, these two together uh, will bring uh, even stronger privacy to, uh, to the Zcash users. So uh, feel free to read through, uh, read through the uh, announcement um, uh, Twitter thread uh, if you want to find out more detail. Um, and then I would like to remind everybody that the, um, um, that the, um, uh, that this is the last vote to vote on uh, Harry's and so Harry Halpin, NIM CEO, uh, CEOs and um, um, and uh, Ahmed Gopours and um, uh, and Andres Arau's uh, proposed presentation at um, at Consensus 2024. It will be about uh, OFAC sanctions. Uh, make sure to vote. I think it's like a really timely topic and also a very interesting one um, uh, that affects the privacy space and of course the crypto space uh, a, a bit. Um, a, so more broadly, the crypto space as well. So if you want to hear this uh, this uh, uh, a panel about this topic, then make sure to vote and let the consensus organizers know. And with all of that said, this was a quick news roundup because, of course, we're back to the weekly cadence with the community calls. So now um, uh, we only had a week to gather news to share with you guys. So let's move on to our conversation with Duncan Wong. 
Welcome to the call again, friend. It's very nice to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so uh, let's introduce uh, Abelian uh, to those who may have not heard um, uh, about the project. Um, what, what should we know about uh, about your project? Sure, yeah. So Abelian is basically a layer one uh, blockchain. Uh, this public blockchain, our focus is mainly on the quantum resistance. So which basically means that we try to design uh, and run a network, um, the underlying cryptographic algorithms that we use are designed to be secure against attacks from quantum computer. So it's just it's not just secure against conventional computer attacks, but also um, kind of like future ready. Um, when the quantum computers become really mature, for example, like counting the number of qubits, um, say if the number of qubits is over, say, 100,000 qubits in the future, uh, nobody know when that would happen. Um, but basically, we need to get uh, what we believe is that we need to get our network uh, ready uh, before the queue day uh, comes. So this is basically our main objective. And then on top of that, uh, we will also like to uh, support multiple levels of privacy preserving technologies. So when I talk about multiple levels of privacy preserving technology, the first level is the basic one is the pseudonymous, uh, just like Bitcoin or Ethereum. We call it the pseudonymous because it's anonymous, but it's traceable or linkable, right? Um, and then for example, like you guys mentioned about the Zcash, congratulations, by the way. Um, so for the Zcash is fully private. Um, so for a billion, we can also support this fully private um, fashion, uh, but we make use of the technologies very similar to the Monero one, but it's a lattice based. So it's quantum resistant, uh, linkable ring signature based. Uh, so it's kind of like quantum resistant Monero as the highest level of privacy preserving. And then we also have something in between the pseudonymous as well as the fully private, uh, which is the uh, which is fully private to eavesdroppers or to the public, but there is a tracking tag, so an authority can have that tracking tag and reduce the privacy level to pseudonymous level. So uh, yeah, this 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 is something that uh, I have been doing research in uh, cryptography and uh, privacy all, you know, all my life. So this is something really exciting uh, to myself. And also, I hope that this can uh, introduce some interesting features to the community as well. So great to hear. Do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah. I'm just super <laughs> curious because you mentioned this. Uh, I mean, it's a new question, but you mentioned this Q day like, and being future ready. So I just want to ask from very far, like, how far we are, like how, how much time we have roughly, like mm -hmm. you know, year, 10 years, maybe in 10 years span of time till Q-Day and how prepared generally the crypto space is yeah. uh, as we approach this date? Sure. So before making that bold uh, prediction, uh, maybe I would like to say something about uh, like if we wait until the Q-Day, um, then we do the upgrade of the blockchain probably is already too late. Um, the reason is that everybody knows uh, right now hackers are doing the crack, crack then decrypt or so-called hack then decrypt uh, methodology, which means the hackers will first of all try to steal your information uh, without being able to crack your systems. But once the Q day uh, comes, then they can basically just use the quantum computer to hack uh, all the information that they have stolen uh, in the past, right? So for example, for, uh, the, the, the blockchain systems, right now hackers can just download all the uh, public keys of all those uh, addresses, or all those wallets. And then once the queue day comes, then uh, we can make the hackers can make use of the quantum computer to reverse the public keys and get all the private keys of those wallets and then own those wallets. So this is kind of, um, uh, uh, th this is kind of like a disaster scenario so that's why we have to do the upgrade bef well before the Q day comes um about the time uh in order to really guess what uh, when that Q day will come uh it's really hard to guess but um based on the current development for example like last year uh, IBM announced to have the 1000 qubit um machine uh and two years ago it was only 500 bit qubits so that basically doubled uh, in 12 months time. Um, we do believe that it's the Moore's law seems to apply as well over here. Um, and in order to reach that Q day, 
um, to my opinion, I think a quantum computer should have at least 100,000 uh, qubits. So we still have kind of like a long journey um, to increase from say 1,000 qubits to 100,000 qubits. Um, having said that, all the technologies are improving. Uh, people are trying to optimizing the Shor's algorithm. The Shor's algorithm is the one to crack the uh, the underlying uh, the underlying cryptographic systems that we are currently using on Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, they usually call that the elliptic curve crypto systems. Um, so by applying this Shor's algorithm or the optimized Shor's algorithm, then um, I, I believe the one hundred thousand qubit is a must. Uh, people are talking about like five years from now or 10 years from now. Um, but actually, if we look into the American standard called NIST organization, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, um, this year they are going to announce the first set of uh, standards about the post-quantum uh, crypto systems. So which means uh, by this year, starting from this year, the US government uh, and also a lot of major companies, for example, like IBM, Google, they are already implementing the post-quantum crypto systems well before the QD. Um, yeah, so I don't know, maybe five years from now, <laughs> probably. Um, I hope that it may take longer um, before the QD comes. Yeah, but uh, we need to prepare for the worst. Thank you for the answer. And there's lots of questions already coming in around Abelian. But before I before we just chime in those questions, I'm still super curious because could you could we go one layer more deep into how might quantum computers hack current traditional blockchains? Yeah. So so that but I'm I'm maybe you know for for an average web three users, you're holding e Ethereum tokens or Bitcoin, and then how much do we have to fear or what's what might happen? You know if Q date comes. Sure. So um, I think there are major, there are altogether two major points uh, that I would like to share. So the first point is about the um, the underlying signature that we are currently using on Bitcoin or Ethereum. So the underlying signature algorithm uh, that we are currently using on Bitcoin or Ethereum uh, is called elliptic curve digital signature standard. So the, um, or, or in short is uh, ECDSA. So for the elliptic curve system, in order to be secure, um, the underlying assumption is the elliptic curve discrete law problem need to be very hard to solve. So that's the underlying problem, the mathematical problem. If somebody can solve the ECDLP or elliptic curve discrete law problem easily, then the uh, the blockchain, the, the 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 Bitcoin or the Ethereum will be broken easily. So that's the basic assumption. That's point one. Uh, the point two uh, is that for our uh, wallet addresses, the wallet address is basically a hash of a public key. So uh, the hash function is already quantum resistant. So we don't need to worry about the hash function. However, if we send any tokens out, our public key will be stored on the ledger. So basically what it means is that if you send say just zero points, say maybe just one Satoshi uh, out, um, then your public key will be written onto the Bitcoin ledger. Um, so this public key is public. And once the quantum computer becomes mature, then the hacker can basically make use of this public key stored on your ledger and do the reverse and get your private key. So once your private key is being hacked, then the hacker can basically own your wallet. Um, so that's why, so for all the wallets, as long as you have one transaction sent out, then your public key will be stored on the ledger. And then if a hacker has a mature quantum computer, then the hacker can reverse this public key and recover the private key. And then the attacker will own your wallet. So um, the, the underlying technology for reversing this public key to a private key is called Shor's algorithm. So uh, Shor is a is an MIT professor. He's still an MIT professor right now, and he invented um, this algorithm back to 1994. So what he said is that imagine there is a very mature quantum computer with say 100,000 qubits, then 
uh, everybody can apply the Shor's algorithm to reverse the uh, discrete log problem, the elliptic curve discrete log problem, and then to compromise the private key from the public key. So, so basically, when we say, hey, Bitcoin, Ethereum, they are not quantum resistant, the main reason is that the underlying digital signature is not designed to be secure against quantum computer attacks. Yeah. So that, that's basically the, the reason why. Uh, but one thing I would like to also highlight is that the hash function itself that we are currently using, for example, like SHA-256, uh, is already quantum resistant. So we don't need to worry that much about the hash function. Uh, we just simply need to say double the length of the SHA-256 to SHA-512, then it's already pretty secure. Yeah. I think we could, um, we could jump into a, a bit more of a um concrete question from from the community it, this one is from uh from rocio if i can find it there it is i think it's a good good introduction into uh into your project so rocio is asking uh, rocio is asking thanks for another great great question how to get started with uh abelian sure yeah so uh about the abelian um as a user first of all as a user uh, i think the best way to get started is to download the mobile wallet uh, from the official website. So we have the Android as well as the iOS um, uh, mobile wallet that you can download. And once you download it, uh, hopefully you can uh, get some of the tokens from those exchanges. For example, right now, the Abelian um, token called ABEL or ABLE uh, is listed on MEXC as well as XT. So you can uh, play around with that. So um, about the exactly uh, what a billion is, um, I think the white paper might be a good starting point uh, for technical folks over here. If you love all those cryptographic algorithms like myself, uh, you may go to our official website um, and download that white paper. And we have already spelled out uh, all the algorithms uh, currently used on a billion on that white paper. Uh, and also we have published all the papers onto those academic conferences as well. Um, Amazing. Uh, yeah. Can I stop you for just one second? Uh, Salazar, please, can you ahead. please yeah. dig up the link to the wallet, the white paper, and what was the third thing? Your your official website, right? Yeah, so I'm not sure how I can type over here. Um, don't, but basically don't worry, the uh, official site is uh, a billion dot info, A-V-E-R-I-A-N dot I-N-F-O. Yes. So all of these links yeah. will be shared uh, in the uh, in the live chat, guys. If you wanna if you wanna check out Abelian. So uh, could we ask the next uh, logical question? Like how you 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 know you painted the problem picture for us. Like what's what's gonna be coming towards in in Q day? But but how how does Abelian solve this problem? Or what what are the you know main design features of of uh, your layer one? Yeah. So yeah, the link is right here. That's right. So thanks for the link. Um, so first of all, about the the opinion, we basically based on the um, uh, the original Bitcoin design. First of all, so it's POW, uh, it's proof of work, um, and we also make sure it's ASIC resistant um, because we would like it to be as decentralized as possible. Um, so if you have a GPU car, you can just spin up your GPU car and start mining the Abelian. So on our link, um, you can download the GPU software, and then you can spin up your GPU cards and start mining by joining some of our pools as well, mining pools. Um, so first of all, this is the uh, the POW, and it's a GPU-based POW. Uh, besides that, um, the algorithm that we are currently using is the ETash, basically. So it's very similar to the original Ethereum 1.0. Um, but we modify the hash function so that the hash function is quantum resistant. So we use the SHA-3 uh, instead of the SHA-256 uh, to do that. But the mechanism is basically the same as the ETash. So in addition to that, the underlying digital signature, uh, we call it a, it's a lattice-based uh, digital signature. So lattice-based is a pretty well-known post-quantum cryptographic system or so-called cryptographic family. Um, by making use of the lattice-based, um, we have some underlying uh, mathematical assumption that currently is kind of well known that the lattice-based crypto systems is pretty effective to defend against quantum attacks. 
um, to be to be quantum safe. Um, so, for example, like the US NIST, they publish the first draft of standards, and most of those algorithms are lattice based. So, the algorithm that we are currently using, um, the underlying one is called Crystal Stilithium, uh, which has already been included in the US NIST standard. Um, we are actually also using an encryption algorithm, interestingly. Uh, the encryption algorithm is called Crystal's Kyber, which is also included in the US NIST uh, first set of standards. So uh, we make use of the underlying lattice based in order to make sure it's quantum resistant. Uh, and also we make use of a lattice based linkable ring signature for the privacy preserving. So as I mentioned early on, uh, it's kind of like a quantum resistant Monero in terms of the design. And um, so we make use of this linkable ring signature to make sure the sender's uh, wallet address is hidden within a ring. Um, so if you have multiple hops, then the uh, privacy level can be increased exponentially. Uh, we also make use of stealth address that Vitalik mentioned a lot about the stealth address. Um, so we also make use of this self address, uh, stealth address technology to make sure the sender's address is anonymized. It's randomized every single time. So you will not be able to link um, these, the, the receiver's address because it's, uh, it's randomized every single time. Only the receiver will be able to link all those randomized addresses. Um, and also we make use of a lattice-based commitment scheme so the commitment scheme is used for basically like encrypt the transaction amount. So nobody will be able to find out how much that the sender is sending out. Um, but because it's hidden, it's encrypted. So we also put in a letter space through knowledge proof to make sure there is no overspending or double spending. So it's a little bit complicated over here, uh, but all those technologies are just used for the uh, fully private version. So if you use a billion as a pseudonymous version, it's basically the underlying digital signature is just the crystal stilithium is the standardized, it's a standardized one, yeah. Wow. Shifting gears, uh, <laughs> shifting gears a little bit, um, because we already mentioned mining uh, briefly, that um, uh, that Abelian, the Abelian blockchain is uh, ASIC resistant, so you can use any uh, GPU to uh, uh, to mine so that it's more de decentralized. But we got quite a few questions about mining, so it looks like the community would be interested in that. Uh, can you maybe tell a bit more about the incentives and maybe the, the token economics, like how it works? What can you expect if you, if you spin up an Abelian miner? Sure. So at this moment, we are still at the first era. Uh, we haven't uh, reached the halving yet. So the Bitcoin halving is going to happen probably in April. For the a billion halving, uh, very likely is going to be in February next year. So right now we are still at the first era. So for the first era, each block, the number of ABLES being mined is 256 ABLES for every single block. And um, the, the block frequency is 256 seconds. So every 256 seconds, there is one block being mined, and then each block has 256 ABLES. So by next year, February, uh, after the halving, the number of ABLES being mined per block is going to be 128. And then it will continue doing the halving um, for every uh, 400,000 blocks. So 400,000 blocks is roughly about three years. So every three years, there will be a halving. And then there will be altogether 10 eras. And the total supply is 225 uh, million ABOs. That's the total number of supply. And right now, they are about 35% being mined. So um, still still a long way to go. Um, the Altogether, uh, it's going to be 31 years um, in order to complete the entire mining. So right now, it's just the beginning. Um, the whole chain started uh, went live back to april 2022 so uh right now we are still at the first era uh, so basically it's that's it so basically like if you are very familiar with the the bitcoin thing you know the total supply is 21 million if you just use that number times 10 that's basically the total supply of a billion so mm. so it's pretty easy to remember <laughs> yeah. why did you choose to multiply it with 10 just curious like is it what was the reason for that 
uh, to be honest, it's just a coincidence. <laughs> um, we <laughs> so we we like the number two hundred and fifty six because it's a power of two, um, and just coincidentally, uh, we started from two hundred and fifty six abos per block, um, and then so after every era, then we do the halving until we reach each block. The the block award is only zero point five, and then altogether it's roughly about two hundred and um, 25 million so it's just a coincidence yeah ever i have a, a community question here which i'm also super interested in so this one is from um uh, from johnny uh jimmy sorry uh, thanks for the question do you have regulatory risks like monero so as we saw you know uh recently um a few exchanges such as binance unlisted privacy related uh, uh tokens and coins uh, it seems to be uh something that people are very um uh, cautious with right uh, transactional privacy is great but then regulators sometimes like heavily disagree with that uh, mm -hmm. so uh, how do you guys uh, do you do you foresee any risks um, are you different in terms of the risks from Monero what is your uh, strategy when it comes to uh, uh, regulatory risks yeah thanks for thanks for this question this is really a good question so um, I think first of all for us um, the Abelian network has three levels of privacy preserving but we actually only use the pseudonymous level to connect to all the exchanges. Um, and also depends on the jurisdiction. Um, for different jurisdiction, uh, the users, it's actually up to the users to choose what kind of level that they can uh, they can use. So just imagine that for Abelian, there are three types of wallets that you can create. For example, say in your jurisdiction, if your jurisdiction is forbidden to use any of those fully private wallets, then you can actually just create the pseudonymous wallet and then make use of the pseudonymous wallet. It's fully anonymous, but it's traceable, also called linkable, just like Bitcoin, Ethereum. Um, or maybe in some of the jurisdictions, they say, okay, you can make use of the fully private to the public, but as an authority, I would like to have a tracking tag. So to the authority, the authority would like to link, but to the public, you can still enjoy that kind of untraceability or unlinkability then you can actually create the second type of wallets. And that second type of wallet is fully private, but with the tracking tag, and then you can share that tracking tag with a third party. So you can do that as well. Um, and then in some of the jurisdiction where the fully private tokens or fully private wallets um, are allowed it, then you can actually create this fully private wallet. So that's why for now, for all the centralized exchanges, we only use the uh, pseudonymous wallet to connect to those exchanges. Um, so definitely, we are actually keeping a close eye uh, on all that jurisdiction thing. But from our technology perspective, we just want to provide all kinds of choices to our users. And then it's up to the users and up to the jurisdiction to decide. Can I ask a very uh, yeah, expectable follow-up question on this? Because as you know, I'm not sure how much you know about NIM, but uh, NIM is running a mixnet which is sort of uh, routing packages with, uh, with the aim to obfuscate metadata from any kind of internet traffic. So would, could you imagine uh, the mixed networking together with, with Abelian in any way, or maybe even the pseudonymous use cases increasing privacy for Abelian users? I think definitely there is a synergy. So for example, like Mixnet, I have been, actually I have been using Tor uh, for decades. Um, the, the, the mix that is actually very important in terms of hiding our traffic um, from being tracked. So for the Abelian, the Abelian is trying to, to, to enhance the anonymity from the transaction level only. Um, as you can see, we are tr just trying to use the linkable incidental commitment scheme to hide the information from that transaction. But for that transaction, the IP addresses of the sender or the nodes, they are all revealed. Um, so we are not trying to address that. We know you guys are working on this mix neck and um, I, I have been also using the tool a lot. So I think we can definitely work together uh, and come up with this synergy by also protecting our network as well by using, for example, the name mix neck, while at the same time on the transaction level, we can make use of Abelian to enhance the privacy. Another one of those, uh, another one of those uh, 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 possible uh, like places where you know the the different ends of the 
privacy tech stack, transactional privacy and network level, network level privacy could work together, just like I mentioned with Zcash. That's a, that's a beautiful idea. Maybe in the future, uh, we will see a, a Nobelian um, uh, over Mixnet integration. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. Just imagine, for example, like that billion, some of the nodes, um, they are connected with your Mixnet. So there is no clue about where those, um, even the miners are coming from, or even the senders of the receivers are located by making use of your Mixnet. So I think that that would be great uh, if we can work together, just like what you guys are working with Zcash. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Because you mentioned many times the the tracking tech in the in the sort of compliant version of the most anonymous uh, use case for for Abelian. So how 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 that might work? So just for us to understand it better, like how do you keep something private and also track it at the same time? That's kind of you know, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So uh, let me just explain. Uh, first of all, let, let me let me explain further about this tracking tech thing. So first of all, for example, I call it the level two anonymity. So for this level two anonymity, you can imagine by using our wallet, you can choose creating a wallet. And then this particular wallet is called level two. So once level two wallet is created, there will be a tracking tag coming out, just uh, some random string. And then you can give it to a third party. So exactly how it works is the following. Um, first of all, imagine, um, when you create a stealth address, um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the stealth address, but basically when you create a stealth address, um, you basically make use of the receiver's uh, public key, and then you introduce a randomness into it. So for that particular randomness, if you generate that randomness, not true, fully random, but it's actually pseudo random, by generating it from the tracking tag. So the tracking tag is a fixed string. And then every time when you ran, generate a pseudonymous uh, randomness for your stealth address, you may hash your tracking tag together with the sequence number, for example. And if you do that, then basically whoever have this tracking tag can do the same hash with the sequence number because the sequence number can be public. Um, then the authority who has this tracking tag can basically find out actually you are just generating this randomness from that tracking tag. So this is actually the, um, a very straightforward direct way for the authority to be able to track the stealth address, but not the others because our, all other people, they don't have this tracking tag. And despite they have the sequence number, if, despite they have everybody's MPK, the master public key, they will not be able to generate that randomness because they don't have the tracking tag. So the tracking tag is kind of like a secret that you share that secret with a third party. And then that third party will be able to make use of that secret as a seed to generate the pseudonymous numbers um, for the stealth addresses. Yeah, so, so, so that's a simplified way to explain how this tracking tag will be able to allow a third party to find out the relationship among all the stealth addresses, but not the public, because the public does not have that secret, which is the tracking tag. I learned something today. So big thanks for that. <laughs> now, Duncan, uh, we, we will have to uh, move on to our next segment soon, but I would like to leave you with a, with a question, from, uh, with a community question that I'm also super interested in. So this one is also from Rocio. Thanks for another great question, Rocio. Uh, I'm very curious, why did you choose the name Abelian? <laughs> That's cool. Um, so, a billion. We so first of all, it's a Belgian mathematician's name. Um, so, if you learn uh, cryptography, kind of like the cryptography one hundred and one, we need to learn number theory. And one data structure of math math mathematical structure that we learn is called a billion group. Um, and in fact, for the post-quantum cryptography, we make use of abelian group a lot because of something called commutative group, which means A operate with B is equal to B operate with A, that kind of commutative property. And that kind of nice property, we can make use of that nice property to, to construct a lattice-based digital signature. So that's why we would like to um, kind of like a tribute to this uh, Belgian mathematician 
And that's why we call it that billion. And another reason is that it starts from, from A, B. So if you saw that it's always at the top. <laughs> Beautiful. Now we know. <laughs> yeah. Duncan, I think I speak for the for the whole community and all the participants uh, when I say that it was a really interesting chat and we're looking forward to hearing more uh, about Abelian in the future. Um, and a, a quick note to the community as well. Uh, we had a lot of success in, during Shipyard with our fireside chats uh, where we brought on uh, other projects, especially um, representatives of other projects uh, in the privacy space. So we intend to do that more now that we have more community calls. Once again, we're, we're back to a, a weekly cadence. We want to make sure that we bring uh, some interesting people from outside of them as well uh, uh, so that you can learn about some interesting other projects in the, um, uh, in the privacy space. Hox, you're about to say something, I think. Yeah, just uh, thank you for all the wonderful comments. Uh, I'm just laughing on the the thread, and but also want to thank you, Duncan, for for coming and educating us on the basics of of quantum resistance and why, what can we expect of the future? Because sometimes I get this feeling when we don't really think about all the possibilities, then we really can run into you know corners where we cannot come out of anymore. So this is exactly the opposite, and that's why I'm super grateful for you to come on this call, even though it's super late in your time zone, to share your knowledge with us because now I feel a lot more prepared in a way for what's to come and I'm not going to freak out, you know, on, on the, on the Q day and throwing all my pencils out of my, my boxes. So really appreciate your time again. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity uh, that I can share with everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Duncan. Feel free to stick around, but now we are moving on to our next segment, which is uh, equally as exciting, which uh, our community has been waiting for. So you're biased, Sudo. You think it's even more exciting because it's your project, no? Okay, I should say at least equally as exciting. All right, and then and then people can decide whether it's uh, it's actually exciting or not. I will I will leave that choice to uh, to all of you. And uh, Hux, you can stop uh, uh, like attacking me like that. I am very excited about this because there's a lot of work that has been put into this. Uh, so let's go. Actually, I will share my screen with all of you. And let's learn a little bit about uh, NIMS Quad League. So first of all, the name. Uh, this name was selected by the community. We, we initially called um, Squad League uh, Squad Game. We wanted to call it. But as it turns out, our good friends at Manta Network already uh, used that name. Uh, so uh, we just didn't want to uh, use the same name. So we ended up uh, putting up a community vote and you voted on uh, NIMS Quad League. So introducing NIMS Quad League. Now, in a nutshell, if there's one um, uh, like high level overview that you take away from this call, uh, what NIMS Quad League is, it is about, first of all, recognizing and distinguishing the NIM co contributors all around the world. Uh, and then introducing a clear and unified framework for community contributions at all levels. So that's from the very basic to the to the most complex. And then thirdly, empowering you, yes, you, to directly contribute to core project objectives. Uh, and these project objectives are uh, are realigned every quarter. So this is the the very high level overview of uh, of Squad League. Uh, I will refer. To, like I will stop and ask Hux whether he wants to add something uh, at, at, like at the end of every slide. So Hux, how am I doing so far? Yeah, super good. So the, like what I want to maybe give some context for yeah, fresher community members who joined, you know, later last year, maybe, but this is a fantastic uh, achievement and big step ahead towards decentralizing the entire community and really making a transparent framework uh, accessible for anyone to just see how I can contribute and just, you know, do the process like that. So I think that I just want to personally congratulate you after the first slide that uh, you you know, managed and pulled this off this project because I think this is, you know, the best that could happen with the community. So I'm looking forward to the next slides. <laughs> well, thank you. You really shouldn't have them. I'm blushing. All right. So next slide. Now, this is a terrible slide. So if you know anything about presentations, you know that you never put this much text on a slide. So uh, basically, I'm not going to read it all out. Um, what you need to remember from this slide, maybe you can take a screenshot uh, and uh, read it later. And this this info will also be put up on the uh, uh, on the NIM website once the uh, the NSL uh, page goes live. So basically, the basic structure of, uh, of Squad League is that there are three levels to it. So there's the, the intern level, which is called Nimster, uh, which is a word that you probably heard uh, before as well. And then there's the Nimja level, which are already contributors uh, uh, who we uh, know and have worked with. And then there's, of course, Shinobi, who are the key contributors who are experts at the project and have been uh, working with us closely on some uh, key initiatives. One of those would be Hux if he didn't uh, join the uh, if he didn't join the, the core team. Um, so for example, Hux helped us uh, uh, design uh, and also execute uh, Shipyard. 
uh, and we're increasingly looking to uh, that kind of involvement from the community side. Um, anything I left out here, Hugs? No, absolutely. And, and don't ask it, please, because you're doing a super good job. So, you know, don't, don't put me in a good... <laughs> I just, I, I just want to hear, I just want to hear that I'm doing a good job. So that's, no, you're, that's why you're I'm... doing a perfectly fine job. And guys, take a screenshot of this uh, important thing to remember is that there are three levels and this is, you know, the progression, these are the different uh, uh, levels of the game that we all want you to play from here on out. Exactly. One more, one more quick thing to remember from this terrible slide with way too, way too much information is the from NSL season one, from NSL season zero. More on that in a bit. I will expand on that. All right. So I hear you asking, you know, what if I'm not in a squad though, pseudo, sad face emoji, crying face emoji, question mark. Uh, and don't worry because you're all good. So let's a bit of a refresher on what, uh, on what an actual squad is and how um, Ninja and Shinobi uh, ties into that uh, uh, structure. So basically, squads were um, were formed during Shipyard, also during Shipyard Academy the year before, the Proto Squad uh, Pineapple Proxy, which ended up uh, bringing us Hux and a whole bunch of uh, beautiful um, uh, community contributions, um, uh, were formed during Shipyard. And this year, we wanted to make sure that uh, uh, the, the, the squads that, that were formed during Shipyard, we of course had this whole process of of, of enabling the formation of squads to follow up um, uh, with those groups and and rely on them with uh, with our plans going forward. So this this is why NSL has has a built in uh, slot uh, spot for squads. But we also don't want to alienate you if you're not in a squad. Uh, you can of course contribute to us. Basically, all of the contributions uh, that uh, uh, squads can do for the most part are also available for individuals. So this is important. So in summary, the difference between uh, uh, what a squad can do under NSL and what an individual can do is that squads enjoy priority in, in most tasks uh, and grants. So for example, um, if um, uh, if uh, there's um, uh, a grant for creating a given piece of content and we know uh, a squad to be good at uh, that sort of uh, that sort of stuff, that that type of content, uh, then we will be more likely to uh, to, uh, to give that grant to a squad because, of course, more people uh, equals more work workforce equals more uh, productivity and uh, and a better outcome. So this this will be a, um, a like a general philosophy uh, underlying uh, underlying uh, NSL. There's also some uh, tasks um, and uh, grants that are going to be exclusive to squads. Um, and then uh, there's also something under NSL called covert missions, which are basically custom missions, either suggested by you guys, the community, or us suggesting to a specific group or, or individual. So squad or individual, squads will enjoy uh, more uh, covert missions than, uh, than individuals. Hawks. Yeah, and, and the simpler reason for this, you can ask like, why would we want to prioritize a group of people over singular uh, individuals? And the reason for that is, is is basically how trust works. So a group of people can easily, you know, bring better results to the diversity and there's trust is shared among a group who has a certain reputation to uphold. Whereas it's it's entirely possible for an individual contributor to really start doing also covert missions and, and all the stuff that Sudo is going to explain in details, but it's just a lot harder and it takes a lot more uh, initiative and a lot more showing up and a lot more proving that some individual person is is worthy or good enough to, to deliver on certain tasks. So this is kind of the, the it's a trust structure that we are building through squads and uh, if you don't have a squad, don't worry. There's plenty of squads that you can join, and I hope that you know these squads are looking for new cool people to join them too. And uh, yeah, uh, if you have any questions, you know, with the whole structure, then you're gonna find the answers across the channels. If you ask the CMs or Sudo or myself, exactly. All right, moving on to my next beautiful slide. So uh, what is commencing uh, as of today, actually it already started, but we, we did a staged release. So we started working with some squads already on some stuff. Uh, and then we're now to the point where we can publicly share the details of, uh, of NSL. We are launching season zero. The reason why it's called season zero is because if it's a pre pretty major initiative. So, uh, so we want to make sure that there is some buffer room um, for us to figure things out. Uh, so basically, with season zero, we're launching a bit of a reduced version of, uh, of Squad League, and more on that in a bit. But uh, as for squads, you know, they have already started, as, as you know from the previous community call, which if you haven't heard, uh, which you ha if you haven't watched, make sure to watch the recording of, it's on, on our YouTube channel. Um, there is an ongoing initiatives, one of the most important uh, objectives of, of this season, in fact, 
of uh, of NIMVPN testing workshops. So the first ever workshops were uh, conducted by by uh, Dawa Rivas and Tupinim Quim. Hello, guys. I know that uh, both squads are represented on this uh, on this call. Um, and squad check-ins are also in progress. So I'm doing those. If I haven't already reached out to you, if you're a squad leader or are in a squad, then I will in the in the coming few days because we want to check in with uh, with all of you. So this is one of the first things uh, that happens uh, under NSL. Um, and um, the uh, ranks. Now this is important. So while there will be, if you remember from the from the very bad slide with a lot of info, there will be a basic rank, which is called the intern rank Nimster. That only kicks off uh, from next season, which means next quarter. So for now, we we kicked off with Ninja and Shinobi, uh, uh, for whom we already created uh, private groups and already gathered uh, you guys um, uh, in those groups. So congratulations for all of the initial Ninja and initial Shinobi. Um, looking forward to uh, working with you. Now, the key objectives for this season, uh, like we said, um, uh, NSL will be aligned with uh, some key objectives for every season. One season is one quarter. So for quarter one, 2024, the key objectives are NIMVPN testing um, and NIMVPN network and community readiness and uh, uh, in brackets also uh, being ready for season one to launch uh, during the spring. Hawks, you took a breath. So I think you want to say something. Yeah, just just wanted to mention that this is season zero. This is the the pilot season that we're running in Nim Squad League. So we want to make sure that we hash out all the last details together with with our most trusted community members, basically whoever who's already been invited to these two groups. And uh, you know, if if you are new to the community and you see this is happening, you're really excited to to do something and get engaged. You know, don't worry because. Basically, all you have to do is just show up and, you know, introduce yourself and sort of stand out from the crowd by asking good questions, by, you know, uh, sort of uh, taking part in the conversation. So there's plenty of opportunities for you to stand out, even though if you're not yet invited into either Ninja or Shinobi groups. Exactly. We can move on. Absolutely. I think this is the next slide too, no? This. Uh, yes, yes, you, I, you... Okay. jump the head. <laughs> Yes, you did. You did. As as I'm, as I'm usually. Sorry, do. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, no worries. No worries. There is a question though from uh, from Jimmy, which is relevant here. Uh, uh, whether squads can join already in season zero? Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, like the the first work of of uh, season zero was kicked off by squads, as I said. So squad league is heavily based on squads, of course. So besides uh, the Ninja and Shinobi groups, uh, um, squads also uh, are very important for uh, for season zero. Moving on to the next slide and guys keep the questions coming by the way so uh, if you have any questions about anything that is mentioned then make sure to let us let us know so here are the tasks and missions uh, this is not a full list I, I again don't want to put like way too much uh, information on a single slide a blog post will be coming uh, out uh, shortly uh, with a bit more detail about uh, squad league and uh, with the uh, ninja and shinobi we're also going to be sharing the detailed task list uh, with uh, with significantly more information but in general terms so like I said uh, one of the key things that is happening uh, and we're really counting on community uh, the community support with is NIMVPN testing workshops uh, in all kinds of different regions. Um, there's also a, uh, a network readiness uh, requirement, uh, like I said earlier. So basically, we need to make sure that enough exit gateways uh, run, are running um, in the right geo uh, spread as well. So that's also going to be uh, an incentivized uh, activity under, uh, under NSL, with uh, heavily uh, collaborating with some squads. We're going to be running a lot of gateways and then uh, a whole bunch of other gateways will be just run by uh, by Nimja and Shinobi. So more on that later. Um, and then, of course, NIM Delegations Program Mentorship. Uh, mentorship. Um, we have uh, all of our mentors participating in NSL. So uh, Nimja and Shinobi are uh, the Delegations Program Mentors. Um, and then we're piloting decentralized decentralized moderation with a squad. This is something, if it works out well, um, we're going to be uh, uh, we're going to be doing uh, more of uh, going forward. I think this is a really nice idea, and I'm super keen to uh, uh, to do it with uh, uh, with many of our channels. Um, and then, of course, there's going to be content creation and translations uh, and building with NIM, S NIM SDKs. So there is going to be basically a dev grants. Um, uh, so there are going to be dev grants available for uh, for uh, Ninja and Shinobi. And then there are covert missions, like I mentioned. So, so these are a bit more ad hoc, uh, whether you're suggesting something that you think you could really contribute to a, uh, to a seasonal objective or uh, or us uh, reaching out to you specifically because we we have history with you and uh, we know that you or your squad are, are particularly good at uh, uh, something. So those are covert missions. 
Now, what should I do next? So, uh, Nimsters, so those of you who haven't been invited as Ninja or Shinobi or who are not in any of our squads, please keep your eyes peeled because uh, with season one, um, uh, uh, with April, with the beginning of, beginning of April, we're going to be launching the broader um, uh, squad league, which will be for everyone. Uh, and if you go back and check that screenshot that you made of that very bad slide that I showed about what each rank means, um, uh, Nimster will be a very open, very inclusive uh, role. It's not necessarily about uh, contributions. You can also just join to have fun and participate in all kinds of activities. Uh, so, uh, so if you are not invited as a ninja or shinobi, then uh, please uh, keep your eyes peeled and make sure to show up in the community. Then as for ninja and shinobi, so I would like to ask everybody to keep a close eye on the private channels that were created for um, for our undercover ninja and shinobi, because uh, a, a significant uh, amount of info will be coming there uh, going forward. Uh, so of course we'll be organizing ourselves on the on these specific matrix channels. So the task lists and everything else will be uh, will be shared there. Now um, as the as the uh, grant list and task list is shared, make sure to apply for the ones that are suitable to you, whether it's you as an individual or your squad, um, and then. Uh, there is going to be, that's not a typo, workshop in the next point is supposed to be twice because there is going to be a workshop on the workshops. Uh, next week, at some point, Hux is still figuring out the details, so uh, you're going to be informed as soon as this comes out. Basically, we want to make sure that we make it as easy for our Shinobi and Ninja to run uh, uh, NimVPN uh, testing workshops in its uh, in NimVPN's current state. Um, uh, as possible. So we want to make sure that we put together all the info and we also uh, do a, um, a, um, a workshop or like an edu uh, educational session with you guys so that you have uh, all the info that you need. And then there's also going to be a uh, content. So we're going to be commissioning uh, certain pieces of content uh, for you guys to create. Uh, and uh, Tam, our writer, um, is going to hold a uh, content creation mostly on writing. So he's a writer, obviously, he's, that, that, that's his uh, ex, uh, his area of expertise. Uh, he's going to be uh, holding a workshop on best practices uh, when it comes to research, uh, when it comes to writing, and also just walking you guys through that, uh, uh, that uh, content guideline that we're going to be sharing uh, with our Ninja and Shinobi. So these are the immediate things that are going to be happening. Um, and then uh, for squads, there is a bit of additional stuff. So I'm going to be reaching out to you if I haven't already done so to schedule a bit of a check in uh, to see how you guys have been doing, uh, to see um, uh, how you guys have been progressing with the squad impact proposals that we uh, uh, that we uh, closed shipyard with. And then, of course, also agree on the uh, on the grants and activities uh, that you, you guys are going to be owning with your squad. Um, so uh, this is both for individuals and for and for squads as the uh, as the uh, grants and uh, and task list becomes available. Please make sure to look through. Remember, in most in most cases, uh, squads will have an advantage over individuals. So as a squad, make sure to look through all the stuff that you see uh, and pick the one, uh, pick the uh, grants that you uh, you think you could uh, deliver on. And then, of course, uh, especially for squads, but this is all, this also goes for individuals. Make sure to propose uh, your covert missions. So if you if you think uh, if you look through the uh, the uh, seasonal objectives, which are an MVP and testing, community and network readiness, and also um, uh, we're going to be building the 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 uh, systems um, to enable uh, season one when Nimsters, the broader community, will also be involved. So. Um, uh, all of that stuff uh, can uh, can use um, some extra help from people who are really good at something specific. So make sure to let us know if you uh, if you think you can contribute to any of these goals. And with all of that said, that is the end of my presentation. So I wasn't keeping a close eye on the chat. Hux, did I miss anything? L let me ask you Hi. first. It was fantastic, and and you know your very is very unfounded because you were you were a bit excited whether you can uh, you know you wanted to know if I, if you need me in the presentation, but you you could have done it by yourself without me <laughs> me just hanging out in the corner. As cool. Some 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 behind the stage info before every presentation, every community call, every piece of public uh, talking that I do, I have like a a, a, a mini uh, mental breakdown. Um, so um, that's that's just how it is. I had that today as well. It's totally fine. Hopefully, you guys uh, uh, enjoyed it and learned something. So let's go through maybe community questions. Do uh, we have there's, any? A, there's one from Gut, which I see, and and there was a fair, like a good question. Can new squads be created? Mm. And uh, I think I can answer that for 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 you know for us. Uh, new squads can be created. Yes. Uh, the the only 
the not the hard part, but kind of the the effort lies in you know uh, making your brand known in the NIM community and standing out. You know, not just with uh, maybe it's not not spamming the channels, but sort of really showing up, building trust, and and sort of introducing your squad's brand uh, to the NIM community. But uh, once that's done, I think then uh, it's just as good as any old squads that any current squads that we have already in the community. Uh, so absolutely, yes, the answer for that. Yes. Now, one thing that I, I sort of uh, uh, skimmed through because of the terrible slide that I included with the, with the way too much info. Um, so one of the things that I, I want to mention specifically is that, go, especially going forward from season one, we really count on... Uh, so um, uh, NSL is really a broad initiative. We want, we want all community activity to be uh, to be included under this one umbrella. This is your unified framework for contributions. This is our unified framework for recognizing our our, our very best people. Um, and uh, with with that said, going up these levels from Nimster to Nimja to Shinobi, uh, we we are really counting on your support on actually uh, at least managing for Nimjas uh, NSL going forward and also shaping NSL if you're a Shinobi. Um, a key contributor. So we want this program to be really ours. So that's that's the NIM community's program, and we want we want um, actual uh, yeah, stakeholdership in this program by uh, by the community. So that's I think uh, probably the, th the 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 single most exciting element of this program uh, when it comes to me. So um, uh, so I'm really looking forward to working with you guys actually on what the program will look like for the next season, listening to all your feedback, you know, uh, looking for all the the wonderful ways you will come up with uh, in terms of, you know, uh, contributing, collaborating, probably, you know, I, I can write any kind of task list and I can come up with grants and whatnot, but that's just one dude me, right? We're a community, so we, we, we have a, a combined brain power of uh, maybe even more than Hux, but uh, that's not entirely, so that's not sure, but maybe like almost there, kind of. All right, anyways, I'm just yeah. rambling. <laughs> well, I'm just blushing, but uh, but what you're saying is completely true, and I just want to extend this because uh, the more more we can think together, the more intelligent become we become collectively. And I think I just want to extend your invitation, not just you know yes, help shape the NSL too, but you know if if any improvement you see across the NIM tooling or the you know if especially the whole NIM VPN testing sessions are about this, you know uh, together finding bugs and finding the best way the to for. Uh, to make the tool work, so this is kind of this is uh, our covert name with pseudo noise, the decentralization squad. That's that's kind of how we sometimes talk about our our work. And this is this is, this cannot be done without the community because we're decentralizing it together, guys. Exactly. So no. yeah. Uh, our dear Matt is asking a really good question. So what's the best way to see the details of the current squads? So as Hawks was, was uh, handling squads before he joined uh, the core team, I will leave him answer this. Go ahead, Hawks. <laughs> Yeah, so currently there's a Notion document which uh, we're gonna share, which which was used during the uh, shipyard last year to collect squad information. So that's our that's our best uh, shared resource right now around existing squads. Uh, with that said, uh, we are preparing a uh, website, of course, where we do want to feature uh, the squads who are in working relationship with NIM or who are we proud of, let's say, in a way. So that's absolutely coming in a nicer, newer shape. But until then, I think the best place to look for current squads and whoever, basically the list of squads who applied for uh, the, the third level of NIM shipyard are listed in a Notion document. Uh, I'm gonna uh, maybe I'm gonna look for a link till you answer the next question, and I can. Uh, share so it, it was already it, it was already shared uh, in the okay. chat by uh, uh, by Sal. So uh, we have two two good questions uh, from uh, Rocio and, and Matt, um, basically asking about the same thing. So um, uh, Rocio is asking whether uh, new enthusiasts can join yeah. existing squads, and uh, Matt is asking whether whether he can join an existing squad. So the answer to this is a hard yes, of course. The the uh, the requirement when it comes to squad is to is for you guys to be really so um, as you're going to be sharing rewards, right? You're going to be working together on stuff and then delivering results and then getting rewarded for that in the form of grants uh, and uh, and like uh, mission rewards and stuff like that. It is really important for you guys to onboard anyone who can add to your squad and you work well together, but don't bloat it too much because then it just becomes like a much uh, less efficient entity. So we count, uh, uh, we trust fully 
you uh, to be able to organize your own squad and you know make these decisions on yourself uh, by yourselves. We don't have any requirements. Uh, we, we don't lock down the squad uh, uh, from new people joining. The only requirement uh, uh, going forward for new squads to form is, is going to be the fact that at least one member uh, has to be Ninja or Shinobi. That's the only requirement uh, for, for new squads forming uh, from our side. Yeah, but with that said, with as, as you said in how you finished Sudo, like there is no requirement, so it's really up to you how th there can be closed squads. So we're not going to exclude if there's a very good squad of three people who can do super efficient work in some area, we're not going to kick them out because they're not letting other people join them. It's just generally a way how decentralized permissionless organizations work that there's, a, there's an onboarding process, you know, maybe someone can apply by introducing themselves and telling their talents are and then, hey, I can do this and this and this. Do you need a new person? Who who can you know design new graphics or code some stuff so it's it's really up to you and there's really not much expectation i think on our end the only expectation is that you know you have a consensus on how things are run inside your squad and in the squad you're joining so basically once if that's in place and it's a coherent whole and there's you know constant thinking of how people can you know make their best work together then that's perfect and good enough for us to not sure if it was just rambling or important information, but I felt important to share that uh, there's no, you know, yes. I mean, of course, like to Rocio's question, like the for a squad, it's I think it's nicer to be half open or open for new people because that that way, you know, you you become more anti-fragile, you become more resilient, including maybe some people are not that engaged anymore, so you can get fresh talents who are super engaged. So it, there's especially in the you know web world of world of Web three. Uh, joining and leaving DAOs is fairly common and fairly like a swift action. So, and that's that's exactly the way how the ecosystem can keep their organizations healthy and fresh to, to allow to have a certain process. If someone follows this process, they can join an organization and then based on their contribution, you know, they either can stay or people barely kicked out. People just either lose interest or leave, but there's also places or, or actions but can result in someone being kicked out from a squad. But that's, again, up to your design and up to your needs and desires and focus. Exactly. Do we, do we no, have any more? Uh, yeah, sorry. At the risk of opening a, a can of worms, uh, I will I will show uh, Bikram's question. So can anybody remove inactive squ uh, squad members? I know, I see, I see the time as well. What's the process? So um, this is, at least as far as I'm concerned, I, I, this is something I don't want to get involved with too much. So as a squad, you should really, uh, and sorry to use the language, like get your shit together and be able to figure your shit out. So that's uh, that's something that, uh, you know, your squad should be a tight unit, uh, who's a member of it should be decided uh, together. And um, uh, and if changes are made, you should uh, make those uh, decisions on uh, on. Uh, uh, on yourself, right? So, uh, or like on your own, we don't want to inter interfere with uh, with uh, like membership and stuff like that. Yeah, it's the same as, as I said before, it's really up to you how you manage your own group of people. You know, it, it can be Telegram group uh, based or it can be on-chain based, whatever, you know, governance mechanism or, or communication platform you use, it's really up to you. We don't keep lists of people in squads. That's super important to know. You know, it's a privacy project, so we don't really list names, but we most certainly don't have like how, which people are in which squads. What we do keep an eye on is that the squad comes together as a as a whole, as, as a team of people who have a shared goal, what they work together with. So this is what I think we would love to see. Uh, we do see it, and it's fantastic, and it's uh, it's very exciting to be together with you on this journey. But uh, you know all these things: how you manage your squad, who you accept, how you accept people, what's the onboarding process, what's the governance process, what's the governance roadmap. If you want to evolve or not, it's really really up to you. And the hard thing in this whole thing is that it's really up to you. It's <laughs> it's it's the freedom, but the, the the challenge comes with the freedom that you really have to sit and talk and decide and design certain processes and things of how your squad operates and how these processes work. Exactly. Now we're over time. So I will have to say goodbye uh, at this point. Um, just a bit, bit of bit of uh, like a bit of a personal note. I'm super excited about NSL. It's been a bit of a pain not being able to talk to you guys in this much detail about what we have coming. Uh, this really is a major shift in uh, in uh, NIM's approach to community, basically. 
we are uh, meaningfully uh, involving you guys in 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 success, like pro project success, which is a really beautiful thing. We have all the bits and pieces now together. Uh, I saw all of these bits and pieces over time falling um, uh, in place for us to be able to do this, which is a really exciting thing. I can't wait. Uh, for 2024 it is a huge i've been saying this ever since uh, to, uh like late 2023 that it's going to be a huge year for the nem community i really meant it and uh why it's going to be a huge year is basically nsl so i am uh, i am in incredibly excited uh to uh to be able to announce this to you guys and uh hopefully uh we can do some beautiful and uh great things together this year have a fantastic week, guys, and nice weekend. It was really nice being here. And there's one last thing which uh, Calambo will have to mention during this community call. Uh, exactly. We would never forget. Code. Yeah, so um, there is a pop-up, of course, for this very special uh, community call. Uh, and the uh, secret phrase is uh, Season Zero, I believe, with a capital S. Hopefully, Salazar will be sharing the link uh, and the um, yes and the secret phrase in the live chat. So you have about um, what? I, I don't know how much time do it do it quickly uh make sure to claim your pull up basically go to the link so that's uh that's uh, nimtech.net slash go slash pull up uh, and enter the secret phrase uh, season zero in one word capital s uh, as you can see on screen uh, and then you can claim your pull up for this uh for this event huge thanks for everybody for joining big thanks also, also for duncan who uh, uh who left us i think it was a really interesting conversation hopefully we can uh, uh we get to hear more about um uh, abelian in the future hux thanks for co-hosting and holding my hand with my uh with my uh mini nervous meltdown as usual uh so uh yeah hopefully guys uh you guys uh, uh enjoy this new time on thursday we moved it so that it's not friday and you can actually do stuff uh other than sitting through an M community call so see you all uh, next week. See you next Bye, week, everybody. guys. Ciao, ciao.